Hello and thanks for joining us. This is part two of Talking Europe, looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on European farmers, on the food on our plates. And we'll be talking about all of these issues at stake with Damien Greffin. We are in one of his fields just outside of Paris, near Etampes. Damien Greffin, hello. Bonjour. You are the president of the FNSEA, which is France's largest uh, farmers union for the Ile-de-France region, which covers basically Paris, the suburbs and the surrounding areas. Have you noticed since the outbreak of this crisis a change in the habits of consumers? Yes, we've seen that people have realized that it was a lot easier to buy their supplies close to home and close to the producers and the farmers. We've seen that French consumer habits have changed dramatically during this crisis. Talking about the uh, CAP, which is the Common Agricultural Policy, let's remind our viewers that represents 40% of the budget of the European Union. This CAP is going to be reformed soon. What are your hopes? What are your fears? When it comes to this crisis, I think there are very few French people or European citizens who have not been able to find enough food. The common agricultural policy is often criticized. People often question its value because people are envious of its budget. People think they can resolve lots of other problems, defense, health care, using the CAP's budget. But this crisis has thrown a spotlight on food security once more. It shows that we are vulnerable. And that vulnerability means that maintaining this agricultural policy, which guarantees food supplies for as many people as possible, has to be safeguarded, because it is valuable. As one of the leaders of France's largest farmers' union, have you had colleagues tell you that they've had uh, shortages in terms of labour? Uh, with this uh, COVID-19 crisis. For vegetable and crop farmers, as well as livestock farmers to a lesser degree, we have had to resort to casual labour. And our role during this crisis has been to facilitate contacts between the farmers facing labour shortages. Because their workers usually come from outside France, given that working the land no longer attracts many people in France, in the end, those farmers have had to ask for help from people who are willing to come. Damien Greffin, thank you very much. Staying on that point, we've got for you a report in one part of France where local authorities decided to call upon migrant workers to help in farms experiencing labour shortages. These workers came with very valuable skills acquired back in their home countries, such as Syria or Pakistan. But these farmers also say that sometimes it's difficult to get the produce onto shelves in supermarkets. Karim Yayawi and Nadja Massi have this report. Every year, seasonal labourers from Spain and Eastern Europe work in these French fields. But with France's borders all but closed, today there isn't a foreign labourer in sight. To make up the numbers, regional officials had an idea. De personnes qui attendent des perspectives professionnelles, qui sont les réfugiés. C'est bien entendu sur la base du volontariat et une soixantaine de réfugiés qui étaient dans nos centres en Seine-et-Marne ont fait savoir qu'ils étaient intéressés. The local government says the refugees will have a contract like any other seasonal worker and will have proper sanitation protection as they work. At this refugee reception centre, several residents have already volunteered. Ce sont que des hommes seuls. Ils sont disponibles. Ils ont des papiers, donc ils ne demandent qu'à travailler et s'insérer. Several of the refugees at this centre fled the threat of violence in their home country, so they preferred not to be on camera. But 20 kilometres away, Kashul Khan agreed to speak to us from the house where he's isolating. From the back garden, he showed us what's motivating him. When I was a teenager, I worked with my father and, and grandfather uh, in agriculture. I'm afraid of coronavirus, but I want to fight against coronavirus like a doctor, a shopkeeper, as a farmer. But not all farmers are convinced of the value of the local government's initiative. Benjamin heads up a family business which grows strawberries and tomatoes. For him, the priority at the moment isn't the depleted labour force. Mes clients, 
font beaucoup, j'ai beaucoup de gens qui font les marchés. Et aujourd'hui, ces marchés sont, sont fermés pour la très très grande majorité. On a très très peu de marchés ouverts sur l'île de France. J'ai des collègues où il leur manque 25% de, de personnel, par exemple. Et ces collègues-là préfèrent attendre, voir comment ça va se passer commercialement. Donc à quoi sert d'avoir de la main-d'œuvre si on n'a pas de débouchés commerciaux This producer, like many others, has witnessed a surge in support for farmers. It's not just refugees who've come forward to help in the fields, but for many farmers, the outreach isn't enough to totally reassure an industry partly cut off from its consumers. Labour shortages, reforming the common agricultural policy and protecting European farmers. All of these issues need to be addressed very quickly now or in the coming weeks, of course. We are here in Versailles, once the place of decision making, of course, the epicentre of the French royal power. And we are joined by François Xavier Bellamy. Hello. Hello. Uh, you were the front runner for the centre right party, Les Républicains, in the last European election. First, I'd like you to react to that report we saw on labour shortages. I feel that you might be slightly infuriated by the fact that these French farms rely so heavily upon foreign workers. Sure, it is clearly the sign that we cannot afford now to pay the agricultural work as we should. And this is also a clear sign that we should build a common agricultural policy that clearly supports farmers in their work, which is to give people uh, the food they need to face even a time of crisis. So we've got this uh, huge crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like you to tell me, do you think uh, the situation uh, needs to be dealt with on a national or at a European level? In other words, do you think that France, the French government, needs to uh, take the decisions, call the shots? We need to have national answers, but we need to have also a common European response. And what we saw in the beginning of the crisis was that the fact that countries reacted alone without a good coordination together. Uh, we saw that Italy was in the center of the crisis, but we didn't react enough. And in France, we had a very um, distanced vision of what was happening to our neighbors. And it is a sign that we do not enough coordinate together. Um, let's talk now about the common agricultural policy. There will be some changes in the coming months, in the coming years. The cap is in the process of being reformed. How do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will affect this reform? The first thing is to defend the budget of the cap, because it has been many times criticized as a former policy, a policy from the past. We see that it is more actual than ever, because we need a common, strong strategy to have a clear autonomy in our food supply in Europe and in France. In, in all our countries, we need to be sure that we will never lack this whatever the crisis will be. And one very last short question. Um, how do you think this COVID-19 pandemic is going to affect the agricultural sector? Are we heading towards more intensive agriculture or more locally produced, according to you? And maybe greener also? We have the agriculture which fits the highest standards in the world on an ecological basis. So we need to be very aware of this to protect and defend this, this model and to try to, to uh, avoid of not forgetting either uh, the, the, the climate and, and ecological uh, policy, which is very important, sure, but also the necessity to produce what we need uh, and what other countries, countries need also uh, for, for this food supply, which is so important now. François-Xavier Bellamy, thank you very much. We're now going to talk to another European MP, Ernest Urtasun from Spain, and he's from the Green Party. Let's see if he shares your views on the future of European agriculture. We are now in our Paris studios to talk to a European MP, the Vice Chairman of the Greens European Free Alliance, Ernest Ortasun, thanks for joining us from Brussels. Thanks for calling. 
Um, my first question is, of course, about the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, do you think it's going to lead to the reshaping of European policies? Is that going to bring about major change? We've already got like growing calls, notably from uh, the French president Emmanuel Macron, saying that nations need to be more self-reliant in the future. The uh, austerity measures imposed in the several member states after the 2008 crisis uh, has created a lot of damage. And today we see health system really in distress in many member states like mine, like in Spain. So this is something we completely need to change. We need more robust public services. And then there are other dimensions, of course. And agriculture, I think, is one of the dimensions which is very clearly um, uh, in problems now because both in France or in Spain, we uh, do not have a sufficient workforce uh, in order to make all the necessary jobs that we need to do in the agriculture those days. And also, we cannot continue relying on importing products from that far away with those free trade agreements that we are signing. As part of the Green Bloc in the European Parliament, do you think that this is a clear momentum for you and your allies? Are you talking with your allies all over Europe about ideas? What are you planning to actually put on the table well, I, I want to start by saying that there is, of course, a risk now, uh, which is that the momentum in terms of fighting climate change that we won the last months completely goes away uh, with the crisis of the coronavirus. And this is really a risk. We are, not talk we are now talking about the need to confront the economic crisis with plans that will, that will amount up to 1 billion, 1 trillion or even two trillion euros in investment in Europe. And uh, we, uh, what we are saying as a Green Bloc and also with our allies is that this investment to combat the crisis cannot be climate blind. We absolutely need to combine the fight against the economic crisis with energetic transition. And that means, of course, that the Green Deal that was supposed to be put in place by on the side of the European Commission needs to be at the core of the response of the crisis. And this is the biggest battle we will have in the coming months particularly in the European Parliament. Your country, Spain, is one of the worst affected by COVID-19. Agriculture is a key sector there, of course. Um, just tell me, how do you see the future of the uh, common agricultural policy? What reforms do you want? First, we need to cap the level of funds that exploitation re exploitations receive. We have been always favouring as Greens uh, a more support to the uh, local and biological markets and, produ uh, and productions, and not that much the super agro uh, uh, industry uh, that the CAP is supporting, which is very climate uh, damaging. Uh, so the capping the level of funds that one uh, particular pro uh, producer can get is something that we've been calling for many, many years. And the second measure, which I think, as I was mentioning before, I think it's very important that we start uh, producing and consuming uh, those uh, products uh, that are seasonal, that can be uh, uh, transport, uh, not uh, um, going uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers. Ernesto Tassoun, thank you so much for talking to us. We now head to Portugal, a country suffering from labour shortages in the farming sector, with many young people moving to the cities or to other European countries where they earn a better living. In Castelo Branco, in the centre of Portugal, our reporters went to Portugal's first School of Shepherds, a pioneering project that aims to rejuvenate a profession in danger of extinction. Luke Brown tells us more. Regenerating Portugal's countryside to reverse decades of decline. In rural areas of the country, two-thirds of inhabitants are aged over 60. But enterprising Portuguese are determined to change that and to inject life back into the land. Last year, the town of Castelo Branco opened the first school for shepherds in the country. Who wants to install a new project? All of them. I'm quite happy with that. This is the goal of the, the shepherd school. Animal husbandry like shepherding was a profession that was dying out. But it's now thriving again with more and more applicants, 100 candidates for just 35 places. We have a, a problem on the interior of Portugal, the most part of young people. They don't get jobs and there's no enough enterprise in the region and they just live to the places where, to the littoral, uh, where there's more enterprises and more opportunities for finding jobs. At the end of their training, these people will receive 5,000 euros to help them set up their business. That's eight times Portugal's minimum wage. It's a deal that attracted 18-year-old Ruben. 
não emigrar para outro e ir fazer a mesma cuidar do campo, o que é o que é triste porque há tanta terra abandonada e podia ser cultivada. On the first day of the course, it's back to basics. It's been a long time since Tanya set foot in a stable. This is the um, I, we will catch the lamb. Tanya decided to give up her job as an English teacher in the public sector. Now she wants to make her own cheese. I think that it's important. We go back to farms. We go back to our roots uh, and do something to promote uh, jobs, uh, the unemployment over. The coronavirus has underlined the value of regenerating the agricultural sector, helping ensure Portugal produces some of its own food supply, as well as creating jobs for some suffering the economic consequences of the downturn. But it doesn't yet fill all the labour needs of farmers, so the government has granted temporary residence permits for illegal migrants, many of whom work in the fields of Portugal. That's the end of our show on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Europe's agricultural sector. Thank you all for watching. And remember, you can find all of our shows on European Affairs, on our social networks and on France24.com. Join us on France 24 for our special farming themed edition of Talking Europe. And of course, the focus will be on the impact of COVID-19, how it's changing our lives, affecting our ways of thinking, and possibly will lead also to the reshaping of future European policies. And we'll be talking about all of that with key European players, politicians already envisaging and sketching out plans for these challenges posed by COVID-19. And we'll have reports for you from France, but also from Belgium and Portugal. So make sure to tune in. Talking Europe on France 24 and France24.com.